All right, good morning, Vineyard Church. Good to have you today. So good to have you. If you're online, welcome. We're glad that you're part of our service today. Actually, we're beginning a new series. I'm certainly excited about it, a series where we're talking to kids about stuff that matters. Certainly, if you're a parent of young kids or high school age, or you'll want to dial in. But the truth is, the stuff we're going to be talking about really applies to kids of all ages. You know, things that, instead of just being parents that say, uh, do as I say, not as I do, we want to we want to parent, we want to lead out of the overflow of what's happening in our lives. And so regardless of where you're at in parenting or if you're not even a parent, this certainly will apply to you. A great example is today's subject, which is about identity. Having your identity properly write, write it up before God. You know, a lot of times our identities get stolen. I don't know if you know that. We, people just... I mean, just like digitally, you can have your identity stolen, right? We all know that. You can have, here's, I looked it up this past week. Some of the popular uh, digital ones. Oh, this is my Easter survey first I wanted to uh, tell you about. Easter, we, uh, we gave a survey, if you were here, and the three top survey results I thought was interesting was forgiveness, which we'll talk about, identity, we're talking about that today, and then this series we're in, raising kids in today's culture. So you chose a good day to be here. You know, but I looked up uh, the, some of the top, top identity thefts that happened over the last few years. Uh, my identity has been stolen uh, three times that I know of. You know, one was Anthem Blue Cross. When that happened, they sent me a little email, said, oh yeah, your identity's totally stolen. It's out on the dark web forever. So here's a one free year membership to some company. <laughs> that doesn't help, you know. But that's all they could do because it's out there now, right? eBay, 145 million. Yahoo, 3.5 billion. Equifax, that's if you apply for credit. They know they have a quite a bit of info on you when you're applying for credit. Uh, 147 million. Under Armour, 150 million. Microsoft, 250 million. Epic Games, oh, that hurts. 200 million people. So their, their, their stuff's out on the dark web. Capital One. This is just some of the. Some of the highlights, you know. I mean, there's, it's out there everywhere. People stealing people's digital information, and you get your, your, uh, your identity stolen. But the greatest thief of your identity is not some hacker in some foreign country or something. It is Satan. Satan is all about getting you confused about who you are. And here's some of the tools that Satan uses opinions of others. We're so concerned about what other people think about us. He uses that as a backdoor to steal your identity. Hurt and pain, that never leaves us the same. We're going to end up all messed up. Shame certainly is a way that uh, society will and people will try to control you, manipulate you, and warp your identity. The media is certainly one of them. Social media is a big part of that. FOMO, we look through other people's Instagram. Oh, I got to be like them. I got to have what they have. And then we start comparing and doing things that we wouldn't normally do. And it's, it's from identity theft. Thoughts in your mind, that's called temptation. And then the biggest, the biggest one is lies to ourselves. You know, there's a constant stream of self-talk that we all do to each other, that we all do to ourselves. Just constantly telling, talking to ourselves. Some of you, you, you know what I'm talking about. You just say, oh, I'm dumb. I'm uncoordinated. I, I'm ugly. I'm, I, I'm this, I'm that. And we say constant things, lies that aren't true about us. And we say it long enough to where we, we start to believe it. We, we convince ourselves. Our identity is stolen and Satan is behind that, getting us to convince ourselves of stuff. I mean, you're thinking thoughts right now. Some of you are thinking, I wonder if this bozo up there has anything worth saying. You know, anything worth that I have to pay attention to. And if you think, yeah, I'll listen to him, then you're listening. If not, you're thinking about what you're going to eat later. In fact, you're getting hungry right now as they talk, right? You're, yeah, I don't know if this guy has anything. Well, I don't, but we're going to together look at what God has to say. And when God speaks about our identity, that's something we can trust. That's something we can believe. Uh, a philosopher said this, Pascal, he said, not only do we know God through Jesus Christ, but we only know ourselves through Jesus Christ. 
In other words, our identity is rooted in what God says about us and what Jesus Christ did for us. That's not new. Here we see in the Bible it says everything, absolutely everything got started in Christ and finds its purpose in Christ. How do we know our identity? What do we know what we're... I mean, the, the questions of life are, why am I here? What am I here for? What am I supposed to do with my life? He's talking about purpose that is found, not just making something up, it's found in what God says about you and what Christ says about you. Now, if you look in the Bible, you see that uh, the word in Christ is used in the New Testament 89 times. In him, referring to Christ, is used 79 times. In fact, that's the number one way that Christians or disciples of Christ are referred to. You know, we, sometimes we use the term Christian to describe us. That's actually only used twice in the New Testament, only twice. Most of the time is this, this phrase, you are in Christ, to describe a follower of Christ, a disciple. And out of those 89 times, 35 of them are referring to your identity, who you are. Now, we don't have time to go through all 35 today, but I'm going to look at some of the highlights because we want to kind of get back any part of our identity that was stolen. It is in Christ, that's that key phrase I was just talking about, in Christ that we find out who we are. What's that? That's our identity. How do we know what our identity is? It's found in Christ and what we're living for. That's the purpose that we leave. God has a purpose for your life. You discover that in Christ. So let's look at what that means. In Christ, some characteristics. The first of all is that in Christ, I discover that I'm chosen, that I'm loved, that I'm accepted. We need those. We, under, we need to understand that because our, a true, solid self-worth is based in understanding I am chosen, I am loved, I am accepted. If you know that about yourself, you'll make different decisions. In fact, a lot of the decisions we've made, poor choices, sometimes if, if you're a parent, maybe you've told your kids that, hey, make good choices, good luck with that. If you don't have your identity rooted in God, that phrase is basically worthless because you're just giving good advice. But the way that we actually make good decisions is recognizing I'm chosen. I am loved. I am accepted. First of all, I'm chosen. In Christ, God chose us before the world was made so that we would be his holy people because of his love. God had already decided to make us his own children through Jesus Christ. That was what he wanted and what pleased him. He says, God created you. See, God created God wanted a family. God wanted children, so he created you. That's why you're here. He, want, he wants to be in relationship with you. Now, from this verse we just looked at, right here, I'm leaving it up. From this verse, when did God choose you? When did God choose you? Can you see that? Yeah, before the world was made, that's right. And, and that word world is the Greek word cosmos. In other words, before the universe was made, God thought of you. And he chose you. He goes, you're the reason the universe was made. I mean, millions, billions of years. Right? The universe is what? F almost 14 billion years old. Right? The Big Bang Theory. You know who came up with the Big Bang Theory? A guy named George A. Lamontre. A Catholic priest also was a physics professor. And when he presented the Big Bang Theory to the scientific community, they all mocked him. They all said he was, they go, we know what you're up to. You're a Catholic priest. You're, you're a Christian. You're trying to insert your faith into science. That everything was created out of nothing? I don't think so. We know that's what Genesis says. And then, of course, years later, they started realizing, well, I guess that Christian was smarter than we thought, you know. But years before, long before the universe was created, he thought of you. That's what it means to be chosen. That makes you special. It says you were chosen. You are God's chosen treasure. You're chosen. 
You know, one of the greatest fears of children, of kids, is to be chosen last, right? Like in a, in a school, like you, it's recess, right? Go out to the, you know, the teacher picks two captains. And then they start choosing people, right? And then the scrawny kids, they're thinking, oh, help me not to be chosen last. Or whatever competition they're going for, you know, whatever it is. Oh, don't help. I don't want to be last. I don't want to be last. It's all oh, the shame. Oh, the pain of it. God says you were not only chosen, you were chosen first. You were chosen first. And when we root our identity in the truth that I am chosen, it doesn't matter what other people say, right? Also, you're loved. You're loved. And that is a deep need that all of us have, right? All of us have that, that, that core need to be loved. And God says, he loves you. He focuses on you all the time. He loves you. It never changes. You, we don't always love God. He always loves you. And you're the chief focus on his mind. Now, how can he do that for you and other, everybody else? Well, that's, that's what makes him God. He's able to do that. But you're the focus. He loves you. Will God ever stop loving you? That's a fair question. What, is, there, is there anything I could do or something that happens that makes him stop loving me? Well, here's what the Bible says. It says here, I am certain, I'm positive, that nothing can separate us from what? God's love. God's love. Not life or death, nor angels or demons. Not even demons can separate you from God's love. Not the present or the future, not powers above or below. Nothing in all creation can ever separate us from God's love for us in Christ Jesus. In Christ, he says, God's love is absolutely true for you, that God loves you. Here's some reasons that you can't be separated from God's love. One is it's unconditional. In other words, it's not like God says, well, I love you if you do this. I love you because you do this. No, God's love is, I love you, period. I love you. If you try to get God to not love you, you will fail. You can't do it because God loves you. It's unconditional, but it's also, it's just consistent. It's eternal. It never ends. His love is not fickle. Like some days he loves you, some days you don't. You could wake up in the morning, oh man, I made some really bad decisions last night. I wonder if God loves me less. The answer is no. God's love is, in fact, we actually make poor choices thinking God no longer loves me. Oh, I doubt God's love for me. I doubt God's wisdom for me. And so I'm going to make this poor choice. I'm going to make this decision because I don't really think God cares about me. I don't think he loves me. I don't think his wisdom is solid. So we're chosen. We're loved. We're also accepted. Now, most, all of us want acceptance. We live our lives wanting to be accepted. The clothes you wear is so that you'll be accepted. The car you the kind of car you drive so that you'll be accepted. The friends you have, the foods you eat, what you say on the internet, what you post on social media, all of those things are your way of saying, I need acceptance because that, that's something we need. God says this about you. God alone made it possible for you to be in Christ, key phrase. He is the one who made us acceptable to God. We are accepted by God. Why? Well, he's perfect. We're not. How in the world can we be accepted? Because God sent his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus died on the cross, paid for our sins. This gulf that is between us, God's perfect, we're not. Sometimes we think to ourselves, oh, it's not that bad. Well, that's because we're always comparing ourselves to somebody worse than us, right? How often do we compare ourselves to somebody better? It doesn't make us feel good, so we don't do that. I mean, well, I'm not a serial killer. Well, that's good. Okay, you're, 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 you're up a notch. But compared to God who's perfect, we're all separated. But that's why Jesus came to pay for all of our sins so that we can live before God clean, without shame, without guilt, just as though we've never sinned. That's what justified means. That's a Bible term, justify, we're justified before God. It means just as though I have never sinned. And when you start to live with that level of identity, hey, I, I'm accepted before God, I don't care what you think. 
You know, actually, there's a lot of people that don't like me. I don't know if you knew that. That's true. They criticize me. They think I'm a, you know, all kinds of things. I give them zero attention. I don't care. What they're thinking is none of my business. Why? Because God accepts me. And if, and if God accepts me, and I only really have to please him, who cares what other people think? I'm not going to give that any emotional energy any time of day at all. This is part of having your identity rooted in Christ, recognizing, hey, I'm chosen, I'm chosen first. I am also loved deeply by God. I'm, I'm his focus all the time, and it's not... It's not going to up and down. It's not conditional. It's eternal. It's unconditional. And I'm also accepted. Number two. In Christ, my value and worth is priceless. You are priceless. Now, in the areas of like art, particularly masterpieces, I mean, they have a hard time putting value on art because, especially masterpieces, because they're like one of a kind, right? How do you, how, how do you establish a value? A number of years ago, they established, a, they tried to come up with some kind of value on the Mona Lisa. Uh, not that they were selling it, but they wanted to insure it. So they insured it for what is today's dollars, about a billion dollars. That's a fair amount for a piece of work. But how do you know, right? Well, God says you have incredible value. You are priceless. God says you are precious to me. That word precious means highly valued, esteemed treasured, cherished. Those are how God feels about you. You have incredible value. Now, here's a couple reasons why. Number one is you are made in the image of God. Not just you, but everybody. Before you were in Christ, you were made in the image of God. The spark of God in you. Here's what the Bible says about it. It says, God spoke, let us make human beings in our image. Now, God's not a physical being it's a spiritual being and so he says make them reflecting our nature in other words god is he's triune that's why it uses the plural let us make human beings in our image because it's god the father god the son god the holy spirit and we're made in as a triune we, we have a body soul and spirit we have the capacity to have emotions we have intellect and rational thought we also have the ability to have a connection with our creator so we're made in, this, in, in that way. God created human beings. He created them God-like, reflecting God's nature. In other words, you're special. You're valuable. You have worth just because you're made in the image of God. You have personhood. You have value. Now, in our culture, you have value based on what you contribute to society, how productive you can be. And when you start to become less productive, when you contribute less to society, you become less valuable. And so as you age, there's this constant sense, oh, I'm not as valuable in our society. And as if you start losing your memory, you have, start having dementia or Alzheimer, you know, your value, what do you really contribute to society? You can't even remember your own name towards the end can't put a spoon up to your mouth and eat. God says, you are, you're made in the image of God, even in that place. What if you have mental illness? The studies show that most of the people that live on the streets have some form of mental illness. My brother lived on the streets for about a little over a year. He has paranoid schizophrenia, he still does today. He's able to control it better. But people on the street, the mentally ill, do they have value? Are they contributing to society? My brother lives in Section 8 housing. He's not been able to work his entire life except for when he was in high school. Do they contribute mentally ill? What about uh, people, be, the unborn? Are, are you, all of a sudden you have value when you're born, but before that you have no value? Now, I know in our culture we try to politicize it, but the truth is it doesn't matter whether you're sick or you're aged or you're, you have some kind of mental disability or physical disability, or you're in the womb, you have value. You're a person. And therefore, you, it doesn't give any of us a right to call somebody that we don't like subhuman, an animal, 
vermin, a rat, cockroaches, all those kinds of terms that have been used before in the past. Because they, they, have this, they were made in the in image of God. Made in the image of God. It's a powerful thing. Not only are we made in the image of God, but we have value because Jesus died for us. He wouldn't have done that if you didn't have value. He had, you have value because God said, you're important enough to me in this relationship and who you are that I want to be close to you. I'm going to send my son, Jesus Christ, to die for you, to rescue you. You were rescued from this useless way of life that you learned. Where do we learn that? From the world. What Satan has convinced us, how he's stolen our identity. He goes, no, 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 I'm going to rescue you from all that, but you weren't ransomed by silver or gold, but with the precious, that's a key word, right? We're precious, and his son's blood was precious by the precious blood of Jesus. So be careful that you don't buy in to the lies of the devil who says and tries to sabotage our identity and says you don't matter. Those lies are rooted in the fact that we think, we look at the universe, we say the universe is cold and sterile and random. That's what we're taught, right? It's just a random universe. There's no meaning behind it, so therefore I don't have meaning. My life doesn't matter. None of us matter. That's a lie that tries to tear away at your identity, so it doesn't really matter, right? It doesn't matter what you do, how you live your life, if you end your life early, if you waste your life in binging in Netflix, none of that really matters because none of us matter. That's a lie. And another lie, you know, here it says, you've been bought and paid by Christ, so you belong to him. The truth is, you, now, again, I was talking about works of art. One of the things that makes art go up in value, or really any collectible, anything, is, is who owned it, right? Oh, so-and-so used to live in this house. Oh, that has value now, right? Oh, and so-and-so you know, own that art or made that art, that who owned it makes a big difference. I, when I first moved here a number of years ago, I, I just got here, I bought a used car. And uh, it's, I mean, I'm kind of older. So the car I bought, you, they don't even make it anymore. It's called an AMC Concord, the, the American, American Motors Co Corporation, which no longer exists. Anyway, so I'm, I'm looking at this used AMC Concord and the guy goes, uh, I don't remember the price anymore, but he goes, he goes, you, you're, go, you're a pastor, right? I said, yeah. He goes, oh, you'll want to see this. And he comes over. I didn't notice it at first, but there was a hole in the car. He goes, that is a bullet hole. And it's from, he goes, this pastor, and it was kind of a well-known pastor. He goes, this pastor, he was hunting, and he missed, and he shot this car. That's from his gun. <laughs> okay, I'll buy it. <laughs> That's as close to the work part I'm going to get, right? <laughs> you know, but... When it, and God says, you belong to him. That's, that's who owns you, and that's why you have value. Secondly, is uh, not only that lie that none of us matter, but I don't really matter to other people. And that's another lie that we buy into. And it's rooted in the, this idea that if somebody really knew me, oh, they like me, but they like me because they don't know me, right? They like me because they don't know what I've thought and what I've done. But if they really knew me, they would reject me. They would not like me. And that's a driving force with so many people. Now, in the church, the church, when it's, when it's operating right, some of you come from church backgrounds, and you have less than good experiences, and I'm sorry for that. But I'm, for me, in the dream I'm trying to live out here at Vineyard Church, that's why Sharon and I started this church 26, 27 years ago coming up this, this next month. Is we wanted a place where authentic community happens, where you can really be yourself, where you can open up and share, this is what I'm struggling with. We're not perfect. We're working through this together, and we're rebuilding our identity in who God says we are. And then we say we're going to love one another and support one another in this journey. And that's called small groups. Now, you saw that video earlier. Jennifer talked about the power of a small group in her life. And we have so many stories of people that have gotten into a small group. They take their mask off. They start to share. Starts out just a little bit. I'm going to share a little bit of something I've never told anybody. Something I hide from people at work. And, and then when you receive the love and the acceptance and the encouragement and the prayer and, the, and, and just the warmth of that, you start going, wow, I... 
that was a lie. I can be who I really am, and people can love me. Incredible verse says, above all, constantly echo God's intense love for one another. For love will be a canopy over a multitude of sins. God says that you don't have to buy into that lie. In fact, if you do, that will cause you to skew your identity. So our identity is rooted in Christ, that I'm chosen, I'm loved, I'm accepted. I am precious, I have value, I have worth. But number three, in Christ, I can make a difference in the world. God created you to make a difference. Now, he pre-planned you. Remember we talked about that? Millions, billions of years ago, you were pre-planned for a purpose. God never makes anything without a purpose. You were made with a purpose. It doesn't matter what your parents said. I know sometimes parents say, oh, you were an accident to your kids. Oh, no. Parents make accidents. Kids don't. There is no accidental kid. There's illegitimate parents. There's no illegitimate child. Kids People are made on purpose. God pre-planned. And we think, we kind of concoct, oh yeah, that's an accident. No, no. God, God says, no, I, I chose you. I, I love you. I, you're accepted. You have value. You have worth. And you're designed for a unique contribution. Look at this verse. We are each God's masterpiece. You are a Van Gogh. You're a Renoir. You're a Monet. In fact, that word Masterpiece is the word poema. It's a Greek word again. It's it's the word where we get poem. In other words, you are specially made. You're designed unique. You know, when God God makes you, there's nobody else like you. Even identical twins don't have the same fingerprint. They don't have the same eye print. They don't have the same voice print. They don't have the same DNA. God does not make carbon copies. He doesn't make clones. You're unique. And so because you're unique, he has a unique contribution for you. He created us in Christ Jesus to do the good things he planned in advance for us to do with our lives. You know what this, I, this here planned in advance? That's what we call your ministry. That's the ministry God has for you. That's why our church, our vision of our church is for people to know God, find freedom, discover their purpose, and make a difference. He planned it in advance. And he's gifted you to do that. That's why we call it, we refer to it around here as as living out your 10. In other words, things that, you know, on a scale of 1 to 10, some things you're not good at, that's a 1, 2, or 3. And everybody has a 10. And and living out your ministry, it's, it's discovering this is what I was meant for. I was made for this. When you realize that God made you, then you have to just realize that what comes with that is, oh, God has plans for me. It's not, I don't just make that up on my own. I don't, you know, if you're, I guess if you think you're randomly made and nobody made you and you're just kind of here, yeah, you, you come up with whatever you want. But that won't be your 10. God says, I've planned you in advance. I've planned you in advance. In Christ, there is all of God in human body. So you have everything when you have Christ. And you are filled with God through your union with Christ. And he has authority over every other power. There's a lot of uh, things that we have to overcome in life. A lot of challenges. We have financial challenges. We have emotional challenges. We have relational challenges. We have vocational challenges. We have uh, school challenges. All kinds of things. But he goes, hey, you are filled with God. I'm going to give you the power and the authority. Now notice he talks about authority here. You see, God, it's God's power, but he gives you the authority. So you have to recognize that you have authority in Christ. Like a semi, one of those 18-wheelers, it's got more power than a state trooper. How is the state trooper able to stop the 18-wheeler? Through authority. And we have authority in Christ. There's a lot of powers out there. Not all of them are good. But we have authority in Christ, and we recognize that, hey, I can do what God's called me to do. And when I live in Christ, I have his authority. It's figuring out what it means to be successful. You see, some people think success is about having as much money as possible. The more money you have, the wealthier you are, the more successful you are. You can be super wealthy and be a huge failure in life. Some people think, oh, well, if I just am famous, if a lot of people follow me on my YouTube channel or Instagram, I'm super well-known, then I am successful. But you can be very successful and be a failure at life. 
You, some people think, oh, well, if I'm super powerful and I have all this influence, then I must be successful. But you can be super powerful, super egotistical, and just be a twit, right? You know, you're, you, you, know you have no, you're, you're not successful. The world might say you are, but for God, success comes from being who you were meant to be. You know, you have an advantage. If you're a female, if you're a girl, a, a lady here, you have an advantage over every other woman. If you're a man, you have an advantage over every other man. And here's what it is. Only you can be you. Nobody else can be you. They're not supposed to anyways. But most people, they live their lives trying to be like somebody else. But you'll just be frustrated because you don't have the gifts they have. You don't have the talents. You don't have the, the, the background. You don't have the opportunities. You'll, you'll just live in, you know, in this land of constant frustration. But you were meant to be you. In fact, when we try to be like other people, it just causes a lack of confidence. We lack confidence when we try to be somebody God didn't shape me to be. You see, you are wired to be a particular way. He gave you that temperament. He gave you those skills. He gave you those, those interests. And, and when we step out and, and do that, that's why we do growth track. You hear about growth track every time you come. We're highly committed to that because we think it's very, very important that you know how God wired you, how you're supposed to live out your life. That you, and part of it is helping you to understand your identity in Christ. God shaped me to be this way. It says the capacity we have comes from God. In other words, how God wired me, how I'm shaped. It is he who made us capable of serving in the new covenant. In other words, he goes, he's going to give you the power. He shaped you away. He wired you a particular way, he'll give you the power. If you try to do, if you try to live out what God's called you to do without his power, you won't do well. Whenever I try to like face the day, hey, I've been doing this Christian thing for a while. I think I got this under wraps. I don't need to pray. I don't need to connect in. I crash and burn. Doesn't matter. It can be decades. It, it, every day, Jesus talked about every day needing your daily bread. And he wasn't necessarily talking about food although certainly that applies. He's talking about spiritual food. We need daily nutrition connected and letting God give us the power we need. But not only when we try to be somebody else, we lack confidence, but whenever we depend on our own power instead of God's power, God wants to give you the power to overcome the things in your life. I find that the strength of Christ's explosive power infuses me to conquer every difficulty. And life has a lot of difficulties that come at us. How do, we, how do we overcome that? Through God's power, through God's power. You can make a difference because God wired you to make a difference. Because Christ gives you strength to make a difference. And because nobody can do your assignment. God has an assignment for you. And let me just say, as parents, we need to be encouraging our young people to discover how were you wired? How is your temperament? I have, I have three boys. Growing up, they were all totally different. They're still different if you know my sons. I mean, they're so different. And part of a parent is encouraging. That's okay to be different. You find the way God wired you. Depend on God's strength. And you've got a special assignment. Be praying for them. Over them that they can hear you praying for them, but also privately you're praying for them. And the grace that you get from God, because we none of us get it right right out of, out of the gates, right? We're all kind of figuring this out. We're on the spiritual journey. The grace we want from God and need from God, we need to be willing to give to our kids. Not everything needs to be a lesson, you know. Oh, that's another good opportunity for a life lesson. You know what? Sometimes kids just need grace. And that's the lesson. Wow. I like grace. We like grace, but sometimes we don't want to give grace. We don't want to give that away to somebody else. But your kids need grace. Here's, I love this verse. It says, for if you embrace the truth, it will release true freedom into your lives. What's the truth? Do we find that from script writers of movies and sitcoms? No. No, the truth is not found on social media. The truth is found in God's word. That's where it's found. The truth about you, who you are, and your identity. And he goes, when you discover that, that releases true freedom into your lives. Last verse. When anyone is in Christ, it's a whole new 
ball game. Whole new world. The old things are gone and suddenly everything is new. You see, when we have a skewed identity, when our identity has been stolen, we make poor choices. And for many of us, we have a graveyard of poor choices. We look and we think, well, that happened and and then that made me do that and I wish I hadn't done that and I wish I could go back in time. Well, you can't go back in time, but what God says is that he can give you a fresh start. He says, old things, they're not going to control you anymore. He's going to deposit in you a new sense of who you are in Christ, an identity. What does identity look like? Well, you start to walk out a whole different way of living. You know, down deep, down, not just here, but down here, I am chosen. I am loved. I am accepted. I have incredible worth and value. It's priceless. And I have a unique contribution to make a difference in the world. Let's bow our heads and pray. Holy Spirit, come right now. Some of you are here and maybe you weren't planning on being here. Maybe you felt like you were, there was challenges just to get here. You were laying in bed thinking, maybe this is, I'm not going to go. But here you are. You made it. Or you're online. And God had a word for you. As you're sitting here and you were listening, you were saying, the Holy Spirit was speaking, prompting something in your life. And you knew, I am glad I heard this because this is really what God says about me. Not the lies that I've believed. I've told myself that I've heard. Some of you, just on your way to church, it got ugly. Last night, it wasn't pretty. This week, It wasn't your best. But God says, you know what? I'm in the business of giving grace. The very thing each one of us needs so desperately. God says, I want to give you my grace. God says, I want to make all things new. Why not take him up on that? How do you do that? How do you say, yeah, I want that. I want a fresh start. I want to step out and trust God that believe down deep in his wisdom for me, his love for me. Well, it begins by just praying. You say, God, right now, I want that. Father, I just pray for your Holy Spirit. Come right now, Lord, in this place. You alone can change, deep change in our hearts. You alone can help us to get our identity on who we really are. We're not only made in your image, but we're in Christ. Now, if you've, not, if you've never asked Christ into your life, or maybe you're far from God, today's your day to be in Christ. Take that step. It's a prayer is where it begins. A sincere prayer. It's not magic, but it's where you go to God in conversation. You say, God, I want that in my life. I want to be in you. I want to receive what Christ did for me on the cross. And I'm going to invite you to pray with me right now. Right where you're at. I'm not going to ask you to come forward or stand up. But with every head bowed, every eye closed, I am going to ask you right where you're at to just pray. Say, God, I, I want to come home. I want to be in Christ. I want to be right with you. God's prompting some of you. You know that's what you need to do right now. And I want to lead you in that prayer. If you'd say, Andy, that's me. I want to pray along with you. Then I want you to let, just let me know right where you're at. Just boldly right now, just raise your hand. Just say, Andy, that's me. Bless you. Yep, I see you. Anybody else? Yep, right in there in the front. All in the back, I see you. There's hands all over. Yep. Okay, put your hand down. Would you pray? This is your moment. Thank you for trusting me with that. Pray with me right now. Would you say, God, Today, I want to be in Christ. You can think that. God will, he can read your thoughts. You can whisper it however you feel comfortable. You say, God, I want to be in Christ to see myself the way you see me. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. 
for showing me grace, forgiveness, and mercy. Help me to start living my new identity in Christ. You say, God, help me to care more about what you think about me and what you say about me than what other people think and say. Help me to believe the truth because the truth sets me free. Now I'm going to invite all of you to pray with me right now. All of you. Just you can whisper, pray it out loud, whatever you feel comfortable. If you're online, pray this with me. Say, because I'm in Christ, I have been chosen. I am completely loved by God. And I am completely accepted by God. And in Christ, my value and worth are priceless. And in Christ, I have something unique to offer to the world so that I can make a difference. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, you know, would you give a, a warm welcome, I mean, just a, 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 an encouragement for all of those who said yes to God. That makes a difference. It changed my life. I lived 18 years not even giving God a second thought. And one day I said yes to him and it changed everything. It changed my whole trajectory. God is in the business of changing lives. And I'm so thankful for that. It's good news. Well, if you prayed with me or you have any prayer requests, let me know about it. The in-person service, the connect card, it's attached to your program. That's a way to let us know how we can pray for you. Also, if you prayed with me, let me know about that. There's a place at the bottom. You can write on there, Andy, I prayed with you. Uh, to ask Christ in my life. I would, I would love to know about that so I can pray for you by name all week long, all week long. Come straight to me. The way you do is just take that connect card, put it in the, in the um, uh, glass bins that are located on the wall and just put that in there and it'll come to me. If you'd like to contribute to the vision of this church, our vision is for people to know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. And if you're new with us, just we're glad you're here. Don't feel any pressure to give, certainly. But if this is part of your church family and you have caught on to this vision and you want to help propel it forward, here's ways that you can do. You can give through the, the website. That's an easy way, of course. Also texting, you know, 45777 and then VCC and uh, the amount that God puts on you uh, to, uh, to, to give check any other way. We'd love to have your support. Thank you so much. Would you stand with me? We're going to go ahead and close in a, in a final song, reflecting on what God is doing in our lives, remembering God loves me. I'm acceptable to him. I have great worth to God. I've been chosen, and I can make a difference. Father, we thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in our lives, Lord. We want to move forward rejoicing and thanking you for all you do. In Jesus' name, let's pray. Let's sing together.